So this question, part of a bigger question um, in which parts of it are in other worksheets. You have a hydrated compound, MA, so that's with an alkali, alkaline earth metal. You can uh, find that part worked, which is to do with the elemental analysis in the stoichiometry worksheet. You've got um, some aluminium. We'll talk about that in a minute. You have halides. We'll talk about that now. And you have some waters in there that's associated with heat to constant mass. Again, that is in a different worksheet. OK, so anyway, what we're looking at here is how do you identify the halide? Well, that's this second test here with conch sulfuric acid. If we add concentrated sulfuric acid to halides, we get different levels of observation. If we have a chloride in there, we make HCl, which is a choking gas. But that's it. That's the end of the reactivity. If we have bromide in there with the sulfuric acid, we make HBr, that's a choking gas, but then the HBr reacts with more sulfuric acid to make bromine and this SO2, which is a nice colored fume and also a bit choking, and some water. Because sulfuric acid can oxidize bromide, it can't oxidize chloride. Now, if we had iodide in there, we see a third reaction. First of all, we make HI, which is the choking gas. That choking gas can, of course, again, react with sulfuric acid to make the iodine. So the sulfuric acid is good enough to oxidize iodide to iodine. But then HI can also react with SO2 to, again, SO2 is a strong enough um, oxidizing agent that it gets reduced, but it will oxidize the iodide to iodine. SO2 is not a strong enough oxidizing agent to mess either with Br- or Cl-. Okay, so in all cases, you get a choking gas. Okay, you get colored fumes for the bromide and the iodide, that's the SO2. You get an orange brown solution for the bromide and the iodide because that's bromine water and iodine water. OK, however, with iodide, you also get the H2S, the smell of rotten eggs. So the fact that we see the colored fumes in the solution tells us it's not chloride. The fact that we don't smell rotten eggs tells us it's not iodide. Thus, it must be bromide. OK, now there's also where. We use the excess silver nitrate solution that makes a precipitate. If they'd included the color of the precipitate, that would have told us whether it's chloride, bromide, or iodide. There's a calculation here that I'm not going to do in this worksheet because it is in the A-level stoichiometry worksheet. But that, again, confirms that it is bromide. So now we'll talk about the aluminium, which has a very diagnostic behavior with sodium hydroxide. Not unique, but diagnostic. In this particular case, we're adding sodium hydroxide to a solution. Now, Al3 plus is a very, very good acid. And so when it's, as with as are all metal cations, we act it up with 3OH minus, and we make this white precipitate of aluminium hydroxide. So this is a reaction in which the Al3 plus acts as an acid, which means that its base is the Al. OH3. So ALOH three times is a base. Okay. However, then we add in some extra hydroxide and that white precipitate dissolves because as well as being the base formed when Al3 plus reacts with hydroxide, here we can have the ALOA3 plus acts as an acid, grabs itself another OH minus to make this soluble tetrahydroxyaluminate anion. Okay. So the ALOH three times, the aluminum hydroxide, is amphoteric. It can be a base, can be an acid. Color observed flame test using calcium chloride. Well, we've seen that several times. It gives you a brick red color. Calcium halides react with conch sulfuric acid, similar to sodium halides. What's the observation when conch sulfuric is added either to calcium chloride or calcium bromide? Why are the observations different? Well, calcium chloride, we've seen this before. Any chloride reacts with sulfuric acid to make HCl. And that is a nasty gas, okay, choking gas, but that's it. However, you take bromides reacting with sulfuric acid, you can again make the HBr in this case, which is a choking gas. But then HBr can be oxidized to bromine. 
Okay, sulfuric acid can't oxidize chloride. It can oxidize bromine, bromide to bromine. So in this case, you get an orange-brown solution from the bromine water, and you get orange fumes from the SO2. Okay, so big difference between them. When you've got bromide in there, you make the orange-brown solution and the orange fumes. When you have chloride in there, you just get a choking gas. Another nice long question here that hopefully the fact that I'm having to do it over several slides will not make it too confusing. So we've got solids A, B, C, D and E. So the first thing we try to do is add them to water. So A and B are both soluble. Remember that C, D and E are insoluble in water. However, if we add an acid to it, OK, we add sulfuric acid. Then we make a pale blue solution from three. C, OK, when we add dilute sulfuric acid to D and E, we get some bubbling there. And when we add dilute nitric acid to E, we get bubbling there. So the question is, first of all, what anion is present in substances D and E? Well, D and E in both cases give you effervescence when you add an acid to it. OK, effervescence is indicative of gas formation. Now, there's quite a few anions that when you add acid to it, make gases. OK, but as far as the A level are concerned, the only one of interest is carbonate when added to a gas or hydrogen carbonate. But we'll stick with carbonate gives CO2. OK, so that tells us that what we've got in D and E is carbonate. Now, before I leave this slide, I'm also going to add that C right compound C doesn't dissolve but when you add sulfuric acid to it then you get a pale blue solution and that's indicative that C contains copper two plus ions okay other things to note although we'll be coming back to this slide D has a soluble sulfate E however has an insoluble sulfate okay so D soluble sulfate E insoluble sulfate so remembering where we are so far, we know that C has got copper as a cation. So solution three, which comes from dissolving that in acid, has copper as a cation. Solution four is dissolving D in acid and solution five is dissolving E in nitric acid. We know that solution four and five have carbonate as their anion because we had the effervescence. We know that D has a soluble sulfate However, E, given solution five, has an insoluble sulfate. So all kinds of fun there. Now let's look at these. Now, first of all, anytime you see bright yellow precipitate at the A level, that tells you that it is lead iodide. OK, so between solution one and solution two, we have lead cation iodide anion. Another thing at A level that you see a brown solution with a white solid, and that tells you that that is copper iodide and I2. Now we already know that solution three has copper two plus as its cations. So that's where the copper comes from. So that tells us that solution two, in other words, from solid B, that tells us that the anion for B is iodide. OK, now if the anion for B in solution two is iodide, that means that the cation in solution one or A has to be lead two plus. OK, so thus far we've got lead two plus is the cation in A. We have iodide is the anion in solution two. We have copper two plus is the cation in solution three. And we have carbonate is the anion in solutions four and five. The only way that you can have a soluble lead salt, by and large, is if the anion is nitrate or acetate. However, at the A level, you pretty much ignore acetate, so therefore the anion of A is going to be nitrate. So we can remember that lead nitrate is A. Now look at the flame tests. We've got lilac, which is potassium. Now, of course, potassium is always, always, always soluble. OK. Um, however, solutions three, four and five, if you remember, coming from C, D and E, these were not soluble in water. So that tells us the potassium has to be in A or B. But we already know the cation of A is lead. That tells us now then that the cation of B has to be potassium. So, so far, A is lead iodide. B 
excuse me, A is lead nitrate, B is potassium iodide. Now the last flame test, apple green at A level, that is an indication we've got barium in there. We know that barium is not for A, B or C because A, the cation is lead, B, the cation is potassium, C, the cation was copper. So therefore barium must be the cation of D or E. So let's take stock of where we are. There are our two data sheets. OK, now we already know that solid A is either lead nitrate or lead acetate. And of course, we're not going to worry about the lead acetate um, as this is A level. And so lead nitrate is the big one there. We know that B is potassium iodide. We know that the cation of C is copper two plus. We know that the anion of D and E is carbonate. OK, so we've still got the anion of C and we got the cations of D and E to work with. Well, let's stay on this one and refresh where we are. OK, when we took D and we added it to sulfuric acid, it bubbled. That's what tells us the carbonate and it went into solution. So that tells us that D has an insoluble carbonate because it didn't dissolve originally in water, but it's got a soluble sulfate because when we added sulfuric acid to it, it dissolved. E, on the other hand, has an insoluble carbonate again because E didn't dissolve up. But E also didn't dissolve very well when we added sulfuric acid to it. So it has an insoluble sulfate. Now, what do we know that has insoluble carbonate? So that's pretty much all um, non-alkali metals, but also the insoluble sulfate. Well, here we are stuck with um, the alkaline earth metals, okay, calcium, strontium, or barium but we know we know we've got barium there so that tells us that barium is E remember we knew barium from the flame test so that tells us that E is barium carbonate so that's where we are from these data now let's go over to this table and see where we are well we know that solution one is lead nitrate we know that solution two is potassium iodide okay we know that solution three was what we made by taking copper two plus and dissolving it sulfuric acid. So that's copper sulfate there. And we know that solution five is barium nitrate because that was dissolved barium carbonate dissolved up in nitric acid. OK, so we're still lacking solution four. And of course, we're still lacking the anion of C. Well, let's think about the anion of C first of all. OK. The anion of C, it goes with copper two plus, okay, but it's an insoluble one with copper two plus because remember this one didn't dissolve. Now um, it's also not a gas former because when we added the acids we didn't get effervescent, so it's not carbonate there. Well, the only things that are insoluble with copper, oxide, hydroxide, or phosphate. Now, I'm going to leave it there, even though at the A level it's presumably either hydroxide or the phosphate because you don't talk too much at A level about oxides. You don't overly talk too much about the phosphates there. OK, however, now let's go to cation of four and see where we are. Cation of four has an insoluble white <coughs> carbonate. OK, that was up here, insoluble white carbonate. As it's white, that tells us it's not a transition metal. But it does have a soluble sulfate. And the only soluble sulfate that has an insoluble white carbonate is magnesium. So therefore, D is going to be magnesium carbonate. Right there, leaving the copper <clears throat> two plus alone because um, I'm not going to say which one I think it would be out of hydroxide or phosphate. There's nothing obviously that goes on with that to make that difference. Finally, student plan to distinguish between the following eight compounds. Use following method, add dilute acid till all the solid has disappeared, uh, add sodium hydroxide. OK, so the first thing is if you get effervescence at the A level, that means that your anion is carbonate. OK, because carbonate reacts with acid to give you CO2 gas.
Now we're using dilute HCl in step one. This teacher tells them that's not the correct acid to use. Why would you not use hydrochloric acid? Well, because hydrochloric acid, the anion, is chloride. And there are insoluble chlorides as possibilities. Lead has an insoluble chloride, for example. So therefore, any time you're using an acid to get effervescence, you should use nitric acid because all nitrates are soluble. Colors of precipitate when we make sodium hydroxide. Well, all hydroxides, of course, are insoluble, so we'll give a precipitate unless the cation is an alkali metal, ammonium, strontium, or barium. So magnesium hydroxide is insoluble. As it's a main group, it will give you a white precipitate, and the same thing would go for lead hydroxide, main group, white precipitate, because neither lead nor hydroxide are colored. However, when you get into iron and chromium, these are transition metals, so will be colored, and you just need to know that iron 2 hydroxide is dark green and chromium 3 hydroxide is gray green. That's just one of those sets of colors you need to memorize. However, this method is incomplete. What's an additional step that will allow, to remain, allow the remaining solutions to be identified? Because somehow you've got to distinguish between magnesium and lead, because both of those have white precipitates. And you also kind of have to distinguish between the greens here of Fe2 plus or Fe3 plus. And the answer is that you take your precipitate and you add in some more hydroxide, because as we discussed for aluminium in a previous question, if you have an amphoteric metal hydroxide, then it will dissolve up as you add excess hydroxide and both lead and chromium are amphoteric. So in other words, if you've got a white precipitate and you keep adding hydroxide and it doesn't dissolve, it's magnesium. If it does dissolve, it's lead. If you have a green precipitate and you keep adding hydroxide, it doesn't dissolve, it's iron. If it does dissolve, it is chromium. <laughs>